Doris. Thank you so Hi. much for joining us today here on Let's Talk, period. You have done a tremendous amount of advocacy for the endometriosis community in East Africa. Mm -hmm. But what brought you to that? What was it about the illness itself that mattered so much to you? How did it afflict your personal life? Yeah, um, thank you so much, Diana. Um, I think for me, the biggest challenge was taking 30 years to get a diagnosis, an endometriosis diagnosis. And it started when I was a teenager and, you know, going to different doctors and nobody really identifying any issue or any problem and just making it look like it was something that was going on in my head. So, you know, so and, and just thinking that there was, I was probably not able to, to stand pain uh, you know, and things like that. So that's, that I think um, really affected my self-esteem. And I honestly thought for the longest, longest time that, that it was, it was a, an issue with me. You know, there was not a condition or a sickness or anything. Yeah. So, so certain doctors that you went to, practitioners yeah. you went to, what were yeah. some of the things that you heard when you were going to the doctors with symptoms? Yeah, at the beginning, at that time, that was uh, again uh, over 30 years ago. What happened is that most doctors um, would look for PAD, I think pelvic inflammatory disease. If that was ruled out, uh, fibroids was ruled out, that's it. All they said to me was, um, when you have a baby, this pain will go, you know, will go away. That's that, that it, you know. And, and when you actually, there is one or two who actually said to me, you just need to toughen up. I mean, period, you know, other girls go through it. So, you know, it's life, it's part of life. So when, yeah. so can you explain what some of your symptoms were that yeah. brought you to seek medical attention? Yeah, for me, it was very painful menses. So um, I had uh, painful menses, very period, um, heavy, heavy periods, and they were painful, uh, heavy in the sense that they lasted, like even in high school, they were lasting about seven days, seven, eight days. And later on, um, you know, as I grew older, I was having periods for 20, 20 to 20 to almost 25 days yeah, in a month. And then there was um, the endobelly, the bloating, diarrhea and constipation as well. Um, you know, especially during my menses, I would then start having, uh, if I was constipated over my menses, I would have chronic diarrhea throughout the, 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 the period. And then um, the other thing was I also had um, leg pain and low back pain as well and just a lot of cramping and uh, abdominal pain low abdominal pain yeah so, so that, the leg that was, pain it. was like sciatic leg pain the sciatic yeah nerve sciatic pain. Pain. Exactly. yeah that's that's very very yeah. it's very hard um so at what point did you feel was there a point i should ask that you ever felt i guess it is in my head Maybe yes. there's nothing wrong with me. I'll just stop seeking treatment. I'll stop trying to find what, what, what's wrong with me. Yeah. Um, what happened is uh, in my early 20s, because this was now in, in high school, you know, the doctors I went to see told me, you know, wait it out, you know, until you have a baby. When I went to, in my early 20s, I actually went to see a gynecologist who actually with contempt said to me, that um, how do you expect to have a baby if you can't even handle a simple period? I never saw a gynecologist for another 25 years because I was so, I was, you know, so traumatized by that reaction. What took me back um, to see a gynecologist was even though I was in such pain and feeling so bad, I didn't even reveal to the doctor what, that I was in pain or, or anything. I went for a routine pop smear simply because, it, it, you know, it was in the media. Everyone was saying, you ought to have your go for a pap smear. So I went in for a pap smear. That was my first introduction back to seeing a gynecologist. He asked me about my menses and I said, no, I mean, I, I didn't I didn't say anything. I mean, I was just like, yes, I get them regularly. And that was it. I didn't want to, you know, like share out more about the pain and all that because I thought it was normal. But then because now I had started seeing him, I collapsed one day in his office. And I had the chocolate cyst and all that. He had he had an ultrasound um, done, and that's when he saw the he was able to see the like the chocolate cysts in the uh, uh, ultrasound. Endometrioma. Yes, the endometrioma exactly. Yeah, and um, from there is when he said this must. Be, and he realized also I had very painful um, painful menses and also heavy. 
actually he was focusing more on the heavy and just trying to find out what was wrong with my heavy bleeding. So he put me on some medication, an examic acid to kind of put it, you know, to stop it. But when he saw that from the ultrasound, when we saw the, the, the ovarian cyst, I think that was my turning point because that's when he said, I actually think you have endometriosis. And then I was, I had to go in for surgery. Did you even know at that point or even thought that you could have had endometriosis? Was it something that was brought to your attention by I anyone? Never, I'd never heard of endometriosis ever. Huh. I, I even asked him to write it down for me so that I would Google it. Mm-hmm. And I Googled it and I found out, you know, I read all this information and I was just, I was horrified. But in a sense, I was horrified. I mean, you know, listening, uh, you know, reading about all that. But there was also some sense of consolation in that I'd finally found out what was wrong with me. I mean, I kept on ticking off the symptoms, seeing the symptoms listed there and I was saying, oh my God, this is, this is it. This is what I've been going through. Yeah. What breaks my heart for you is that, and this is, and this is reflective of what happens to so many women, even, in, even for myself, you yeah. start doubting, like you said, it affected your self-esteem that you didn't want to go see a doctor or tell them what was really going on because you didn't want one more person to tell you, Oh, it's nothing. Oh, it's normal. Or here you should have a baby. When is that a medical diagnosis or intervention to bring another life into this world? Plus we know that endometriosis and infertility go hand in hand. That's That's its own separate issue. And then on top of that, that's a a choice. Not every woman has to have a baby. That is not every woman's fate or want. Um, So at what point did you say, wow, this is something that I've had for 30 plus years. I'm finally getting treatment. Did you talk to other women and then learn they had similar experiences? How did you know that you weren't alone in this? Yeah. After the, when I went, when I had my laparoscopic surgery, when the doctor went in, of course, and he, he granted the cysts and, uh, you know, and then, and then he was able to also ascertain the level, the stage at which I was at, um, you know, because he saw how advanced it was. And he told me that I was at stage four, I had stage four endometriosis. I knew then that I'd had it for long. And he, he even mentioned to me that you've had it for a very long time. And I said, I started having these problems when I was a teenager. You know, so um, thereafter, obviously, I was I really wanted to, to look for some sort of support, you know, look for people who, who might be going through this. I just went on Facebook, you know, started a, a group and, and just started looking for people, you know, uh, trying to get a group going women talking about it and all that. And it was very difficult to even find people who were talking about endometriosis at the time. Yeah. Was there, you know, we, you and I mentioned uh, before we start the interview about the cultural difference, because here in yes. the United States, women have very similar stories to what happened to you in mm-hmm. Africa. It, it goes back to the common theme that women, no matter where they are, of course, at different and varying degrees, encounter women's health not being a priority, many symptoms being dismissed, and women not being heard. But yet, men there's a lot more treatment and intervention. What, what is the difference you think between uh, the United States and how they view endometriosis and what's going on in Africa right now? I think um, um, that's a really good question. I think first of all, it became um, more well known, more known, I think in, 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 for example, in the US way before it got known here. And um, um, one of the things I think during my time, it was completely unknown. Our doctors were not being taught about it. But I do know for a fact that in Kenya, um, I think around 2009, it became included in the curriculum, in the me- medical health curriculum. So, mm-hmm. so that doctors were taught about endometriosis. See, previously, they used to be told that if a girl presents, you know, with, with um, issues, you know, menstrual issues, the first thing to look for is PID, you know, that um, pelvic inflammatory disease, which is some sort of, I think, STD or something. Yes. And yeah, to kind of look for that. But now they've been told the first point of action should be to suspect endometriosis or painful periods. And that's just one simple thing, having it introduced in the curriculum, in their curriculum. Yeah. But before then, you can imagine the doctors who went to school before that time. And the girls who continue to, girls and women who continue to see doctors 
who don't go for regular updates, you know, in terms of, you know, their knowledge and all that, they still think it's PID. <laughs> Well, then Kenya is more advanced than even here in the U.S. because I, at the end of Bound, they're working to get that taught into the curriculum on a nationwide level. We've been successful helping to lobby it in New York State, but it isn't yeah. something that's taught in schools, what we're hoping for. But even yeah. for doctors here, it's not something that's top of mind to learn about. And if there's okay. not knowledge, there isn't power. And yeah. as we know, ignorance can be very, very dangerous. And yeah. it comes with a, a lot of pain and suffering for women that have it. And also, not to mention, there's so many more things than pain that goes along with it. You can cause mm -hmm. silent kidney failure. Um, mm -hmm. You can lose organs. You can also lose your reproductive organs. I mean, okay. it goes on and on. Lung collapse. It's a very yeah. serious illness. And I don't think the severity is talked about as, as much. What's your yeah. hope with your organization? Um, what do you hope to achieve? Yeah, uh, the biggest thing that we've really been fighting for really is for early diagnosis. And, and um, through, the, through the organization, Endo Sisters East Africa Foundation. So we've been pushing for early diagnosis. And that's why we've really tried to do our interventions at the school's level, because we believe that once we when it's, it's taught early, once girls are aware early, they're empowered to go into gynecologists, they get early diagnosis, they can be able to mitigate because they're able to, to slow down the disease. They're able to get on treatment early. They're able to have a better quality of life, you know, and, and they're informed. So they know to, write, to ask the right questions, they know to make the right choices, you know, there's, there's issues like egg freezing. I mean, it, it's here now, quite expensive, but those are options that girls will have and women will, young women will have in terms of moving forward. So what we have done is we've also introduced it into the Kenyan curriculum. So it's actually going to start also in the, within the Kenyan education curriculum. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Endometriosis is taught uh, in, in, in the medical curriculum, and so they know about it. But now we were having it introduced in the Kenyan curriculum. And I'm glad to say that it, it's starting from next year. No, that's very, yeah. that's pioneering. Congratulations on that. That's amazing work. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Is there still a stigma around talking about a woman's menstrual health? Yes, that stigma the stigma is there. And I think um, we, we, in 2000, in, in 2019, last year, November, um, Kenya introduced uh, the menstrual health management policy. And it, it's a fantastic policy because it was the start of now talking about this menstrual, you know, you know, bringing awareness about menstrual health. But, and in fact, one of the first, I think one of the first points, the, the strategic objectives is about the stigmatizing, you know, the myths, the taboos and all that. But the interesting thing is that Everything about that policy only talks about issues of disposal, um, you know, sanitation issues. It talks about a little bit about hygiene. It doesn't get into the nitty gritties of menstrual disorders, for example. You know, it doesn't talk about their conditions. Sometimes menstruation is not normal for girls. Some girls will have abnormal or, or, or menstrual disorders such as endometriosis, you know, fibroids, all these other adenomyosis, all these other things. Sometimes it doesn't work, abnormal uterine bleeding, all these kind of things. So that is not addressed. And when you don't address that, then how do you then get to talking about this organization? You see, so that's part of the problem. Well, I think that's why it's so important that you are leading a conversation. You're leading a conversation that is going to span from continent to continent, and it needs to be heard. There's no shame in talking about endometriosis or your menstrual cycle or anything going on with the woman's body because it's a natural way of life. And if we don't talk about it, doctors don't know about it and women can't get the treatment that they need. Very true, yeah. And we've also seen that, um, I think even new studies are showing that it seems to be like a systemic, is it, what's the, the correct word? Is it systemic disease? A disease that affects the whole, you know, systemic, condition yeah. that affects the, yeah, that affects the whole body. Um, I'm currently in menopause, but I'm still getting normal bleeding. Three years down the line, you know, three years into menopause, and I still have abnormal bleeding episodes. So these are, of course, 
things that are not abnormalities, and and this is as a I I highly suspect it's it, it's linked to the in, you know endometriosis. I'm sure it is. I'm sure yes. it is because there yes. there's also the misnomers that even people earlier about endometriosis. I was told, oh, don't worry about it. You'll be yeah. fine when you hit menopause. But now we're yes. learning that's not the case. Yeah. That it can it can lead it can lead on. So yeah. Again, there's so much to be discovered because it is a perplexing disease. I've now been diagnosed since 2016 and I still mm-hmm. don't understand it. I am trying, but there's so much and there's so much changing in the research, um, yeah. but it's very complicated. And like we said, it's, it affects the entire body. It's chronic and it's inflammatory. Yeah, it, yeah, it is. It's chronic. It's inflammatory. And um, what we have seen with, because we now have a, a, what we call the women and girls uh, program, where we have a group of women who we, we get together and share. I had to do, I had to set that up after what I had gone through without any support. And, and um, within that group, one of the things that we see is that these, these the common things, common features, people, women either have endometriosis alone, and those are the few fewer women, but most of the women either have endo and adenomyosis yeah. or they have endometriosis and fibroids yeah. you know and i had seen some research that showed that 26 percent of women who have endometriosis are likely to get fibroids and women 20 percent of women with fibroids are likely to get endometriosis so it, it's, it's hands in hand just crazy yeah that is if people want to join your organization volunteer how can they do yeah. so First of all, we've got a campaign that's ongoing. It's called um, hashtag Yellow Nails Movement. So what we do is we encourage, um, you know, we, lo- we, we sort of an interesting way of encouraging young girls, especially to be interested in, in you know, in learning more about endometriosis. So we thought, well, endo, you know, the color is yellow. So we thought about the yellow nails. Ah, <laughs> I love it. I love yeah, it. and I have yellow and purple because I have the the the. And Endo found one as well, and we know it's Foundation of America one as well, and plus ours. Yeah, so um, we encourage them to just paint their nails yellow, take a photo, post on social media, and and say something about endometriosis. So those that's for women and for girls, and then for for men and, and, and boys who may be interested, we ask them to, to just tag friends and say something about endometriosis, such as one in ten women have endometriosis. They can also get in touch with us. You know, on a, a social email, to, um, sorry, social media account, Instagram at Endo Sisters EA, and the same on Twitter as well at Endo Sisters EA, and also uh, on our, our website, info at Endo Sisters East Africa. Thank you. As I said before, you're doing such incredible work, and I'm so glad that you are also on the road to to feeling healthy. And I hope that you get more answers too. And that's a whole yeah. separate discussion. We need to to have you come back about menopause and endometriosis. Yes, 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 yes. I actually have some funny symptoms that I'm even wondering. <laughs> but well, that's again, as you're saying, is a different discussion. Yeah, yeah. and we'll have that discussion. <laughs> Thank you so yeah. much, Doris. It was wonderful to see you. Thank you. Thank you.